Good afternoon and welcome back to those of you who are joining us again and um, welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. Um, I want to say something before we get into the material today. Um, we're beginning to move into material which is going to be challenging for some people. Um, some people are going to find it surprising. Perhaps some of the information may be shocking. Um, some people may find themselves feeling defensive. Um, other people may find themselves feeling a lot of anger. I want to invite everyone to just recognize your feelings and consider it part of the learning process that we're in together. I wanted to um, point out that we are not the only conference or the only denomination that is going through a process of um, looking again at our history and looking at it with new information, with more understanding um, of the facts of what has happened. I noticed on Facebook um, this week, someone posted an invitation to a meeting um, of Methodists talking about acts of repentance, um, talking specifically about how native indigenous peoples had been affected by white supremacy um, in the church. I also then, I got curious about what other churches were doing this. And I found that the Episcopal church has created a, a working group, quote, um, to sharpen the church's focus on confronting the past its past complicity with racist systems and the lingering legacy of white supremacy embedded in institutions like the church. Then I saw um, that there was a group of denominations that have called for a truth and reconciliation process within churches. And this included the Episcopal Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the Franciscan Action Network, um, the Friends Committee on National Legislation, the Jesuit Conference Office of Justice, the Christian Reformed Church of North America's Board of Race Relations, and as I've said, the United Methodist Church. And I was particularly struck by a comment that was made by the Reverend George Tinker, um, who is a, a Native American pastor. He said, if United Methodists are serious about repenting for past injustices against Native peoples, they must prepare for a long and painful journey. There is a lot of history that has been concealed. You have to go and dig it up. And we are so fortunate to have presenters who have been going and digging it up. Um, and so we will hear, be hearing things today that we may have never heard before. Um, and I'm very grateful that we have Dr. Williams with us to do this presentation. We're gonna open as we usually do each week with Pule, and today it will be led by the Luna Ho'omalo of Hayhek, Hayhek, Brian, I'm sorry, Kahu Brian Welsh. Can't get my words out. <laughs> thank you very much, Linda. Thank you for those good opening words too, and uh, information that I actually hadn't heard of all those groups that are uh, in this journey with us. Um, I start with gratitude uh, on behalf of the Association of Hawaiian Evangelical Churches for the hard work and the skilled presentations which are opening the eyes, um, revealing things um, as, as you mentioned. So I'm going to ask for prayer as we desire to have uh, wisdom, discernment, uh, favor uh, for what comes next, whatever, whatever the divine resources become available for us to move forward. Uh, so let's bow our heads together. E puli kako. Mahalo keakua for the opportunity to gather here as a hui of people uh, learning. We're working together to learn from these skilled presenters, uh, amazing things that for many of us uh, we've been unaware of. And so I just ask that you'd help us to have discernment for truth. We ask for heavenly resources to be able to have insight, to be able to have favor through the spirit of God's work in our life as we discern. And then with that discernment, we ask for your favor to what comes next, what directions to, to follow, what would be the future. And so we just ask that we continue to walk with the steps of Jesus Christ in grace and favor and in forgiveness and aloha. 
We pray that that love might permeate all of our action steps as we ask you through his powerful and wonderful name. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Mahalo, and now we'll turn it over to Dr. Ron Williams, Jr. Okay, aloha mai kako. Um, as uh, for those of folks who weren't here last week, I'll just give you a brief introduction of who I am. Um, my name is Ron Williams, Jr. Uh, my father is Ron Williams, Sr., uh, a hunter, fisherman, farmer from Arkansas. My mother is Janet Marie Labounty, a um, woman who comes from Chicago, Illinois, which is where I was born. Her descendant, her forefathers and mothers come from uh, England, France, Wales, uh, and Scotland. Um, I moved to Hawaii in 1997. Uh, and I've been there since. Uh, I still consider myself Malahini or a visitor to Hawaii. It's not my my home, um, but I've got uh, went back to school in, in my later years at 32 um, and got my BA in Hawaiian studies, my MA in Pacific Island studies, and my PhD in Hawaiian history. Uh, so that's who I am. Um, last, if you did miss last week and you haven't had a chance to look it over, we kind of talked about the early mission in Hawaii from 1820 onward, actually before 1820 onward. Uh, and how it was important to understand that that mission had a serious, a significant inflection point and a serious change in 1863, when the folks in Boston um, said, you've completed your mission, they declared Hawaii a Christian nation, uh, and, and they said, you know, now the, the, uh, the mission can be handed over to Native Hawaiians to run their churches. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today, is um, from 1863, from that handover of power onward, and so we need to understand that we're specifically that we're not talking about the missionaries per se, as we are more, more talking about the missionary sons and grandsons. Um, there's not a binary there. There's not that one group's good and one group's bad. It's, it's complicated, uh, like I always say. Um, but we're going to walk through that history today of the sons of the mission from 1863 to 1888. Um, and as she mentioned to start, there's some difficult things in here. Um, if you know, we're going to talk about, you know, the, we're going to answer the question. Uh, were the missionaries involved in the overthrow and political movements and so forth. Uh, and we're going to talk about white supremacy, as she mentioned, and we're going to talk about some motivations for these things. Um, and these aren't going to be my theories on them. They're going to be from their words. So I'm going to read quite a bit, a few quotes today. Um, I hope that's okay. But I wanted the folks to speak for themselves. Um, so these are primary sources. They're original letters held mostly at, at Harvard at Houghton Library, but also at Bishop Museum at the, in the Judd Collection and other collections. And I'll read through those and kind of walk us through this, this alternate or this uh, change in the mission um, to a more pragmatic and, and an earthly mission um, that, that, that carried with it many problems. And so what, that's what we're gonna talk about today, okay? I wanna thank everyone for inviting us for coming, but also everyone for hosting us and the UCC and AHEC. Um, very, very um, glad for this opportunity. Um, and I also want to ask us uh, a couple of, just put us on the right framework and say, we're, we're here today gathered uh, as a group of, or as, a, as people talking about Christianity in Hawaii, uh, not just political science, not just history, but this Christian history. And so I would argue that there's a little bit of a higher calling, a little bit of a higher responsibility uh, to when we start to look at these, at these questions. Um, not what would an average person do, but what would a Christian do? Uh, and we start to, we can analyze, we can start to analyze these, these actions through those lenses. Okay. I want to, there was a couple of questions left over from last week. So I'm going to share my screen and I want to finish those up. I don't want to leave any questions unanswered. And on that note, please do think of questions as we go along. Uh, I think if you drop them in the chat, they're going to be presented to me at the end of the meeting. Um, and then also th there might be a chance also just to just to, um, send them at that time also. But please do ask questions. That's that's the way we get to learn what you're interested in uh, and kind of get you some more information if we can, what, what we have. OK, so, OK, let's move. Let me go down to ongoing projects. HCC. Now here it is. OK, so uh, there were three questions, I believe, that were left unanswered last week. One of them was a question that I answered, but incorrectly. I misunderstood the question. Uh, the question was this. <clears throat> what was the last document Dr. Williams read? I took it a little too literal. I thought the person meant literally what was the last document I read, but they were talking about the last document I read in the talk um, that we were that we were that I was giving. So um, that document was uh, a document that it was an essay that I was invited to write for the Oxford Encyclopedia of Religion in America. Um, Oxford University Press puts out an encyclopedia every ten years of different topics. One of them is religion in America. Um, and I was invited to write the essay on um, the Christian mission in Hawaii. And so that 
quote, those quotes that I read at the end there came from that document, um, which is available uh, at one of the links that was put up with last week. Um, so it's it's an essay called uh, Christian, I think it's called the Christian Mission in Hawaii or something like that. Um, but it's it's one of the links that's allowed. Okay, so that's that. The second question, 160 years after Rufus Anderson's meeting in 1863, what would Rufus Anderson say about how the church is run today, which is now the HCUCC? Okay, I have no idea. <laughs> no, I'm not just avoiding the question. Uh, as a historian, I really don't, you know, I, I, I get, I get nervous, and not only nervous, I get frustrated when folks say the queen would have would have done this kolakawa would have done this whether we're talking about mauna kea whether we're talking about a funding issue whether we're talking about because we don't know um we can say after studying the king's behavior and the king's life i would bet that he would blah 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 but but it's 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 significantly a, a reach to say that this person would say this or do this in these circumstances that are 2022. That said, I can tell you that um, I'm wholeheartedly assured that Rufus Anderson, because he wrote about it himself, that Rufus Anderson was significantly frustrated um, and kind of um, to the point of, of being almost angry with the, with the mission here in Hawaii post-1663 because it wasn't forming into what he had dreamed it to be. And that was a native-led, native-run mission. He talks about that quite a bit. I gave you a few quotes last week um, and uh, we'll talk about that some more today. So that, that, that mission that he had dreamed up was for Americans to take the word of God to Hawaii, give it to Hawaiians and let them build uh, an institution and a framework, framework and a structure that had local authority, right? Remember, we're Congregationalists and Presbyterians here. And so they had local authority and there was no central body looking over all them. And that's exactly kind of what the opposite of what happened post-1863. So I, I, I know Rufus was very frustrated. I don't know what he would say about the church today because I don't know how the church is run today. Um, okay, I got out of that one. Okay, um, in Re Reverend Titus Cohn's autobiography, he stated that Rufus Anderson's instructions to place native Christians in control of their churches, that while the instruction was a subject of much debate among missionaries, that he took action to implement Anderson's instruction and among the congregations in his area. Ha'ili Church's account of its own history says that Cohn remained the pastor of Ha'ili until his death in the 1880s. The difference between the church's account and the Cohn's autobiography leaves me puzzled. Did you find evidence of Cohn's action to place native Christians as pastors over, over the bigger, various congregations of Hilo and Puna? So yes and no, again, um, I didn't study Cohn in particular. He wasn't one of the case studies I did, but I did quite a few. I did Reverend Bond and I did uh, Reverend Deshaies and others throughout that area. And the, in general, the talk about moving natives into the pastorships was, was mostly talk. It was mostly trying to get the ABCFM off their backs. Um, I'm not gonna go to motivations because I, I can't know, um, but some of the things they wrote and said portrayed their their whether it was sincere or not whether it was excuse or not they say we don't think Hawaiians are qualified um so 1870s 1880s many of the past many of the, well, the foreign many of the American pastors or or native born white pastors in Hawaii who were hanging on to their congregations were saying they didn't believe Hawaiians could had the had the ability to take over control um now again that could have been an excuse or it could have been sincere um but that's what they were saying Okay, so that's that. Um, let's move into today's presentation. I'll open it up here. It'll be shorter than last month, last week, I promise. Uh, we'll get through this. Okay, here we go. The American Protestant Mission to the Hawaiian Islands is the overall title, part two, which is Ho'eo'eo Ho, Sons of the Mission and the Shaping of a New Mission. So again, I set it up where we, we understand that coming into 1863, they had declared Hawaii a Christian nation Reverend Anderson had told them to create this native-run, native-led mission, but the sons of the mission had started to get involved in politics, started to get involved in business, and actually more than started. Had, had, uh, some of them had gone deeply into, into economic uh, pursuits, um, and now they had different motivations uh, for, for control of the churches. Okay, so let's look at that. 1863 as an inflection point, challenges and opportunities for the sons of the mission. So the, the challenges are that Boston is pressuring them to turn over power to this native association, right? The Ahui Wanaleo Ohova'i, the Hawaiian Evangelical Association, was that local body of churches, right, run by a board, Papa Hawaii, in Honolulu. And in the 1860s, it was almost exclusively white. 
and the, Boston is pushing them to turn over power to Native Hawaiians, and Native Hawaiians are pushing them in the churches to turn over power to them, right? So there's a lot of challenges for the, for, for the uh, sons of the mission, but there's a lot of opportunities, and the opportunities came in the way of economics. Ralph Kuykendall calls this period in the 60s, he says, in no respect is the transitional character of the period more marked than in the sphere of economics. 1863 was the first year in Hawaii in which the value of exports topped $1 million, right? The American Civil War had, had, was underway. Uh, planters and farmers throughout the South who had planted beet sugar crops were now off fighting. Um, the production of sugar plummeted uh, and the demand kept rising. And so sugar became basically gold in the, in, around the world. Uh, and some of the early plantations here were starting to make significant uh, money farming sugar. And so in this 1863 point, there's a lot of opportunity for people who have gotten the land. So mills, machinery, transportation, and related businesses all grew extensively at this time, offering large profits for stakeholders. The business expansion and rising profits drew a sharp contrast between competing interests in the kingdom, and many sons of the mission who had become deeply involved in these economic developments were clashing with native monarchs over more than just issues of morality, right? So in the 1840s and 50s, you have the American mission kind of clashing might be a too hard of a word, but, but, but interacting with the, the Hawaiian government about and pushing for certain laws of morality and so forth. Um, well, that's going further now. That's going into this area of, well, we think you should pass these taxes. We think you should do this import. We think you should, and we're going to talk about in this chapter in the Red Treaty of Reciprocity and these types of things that spur economic development of Hawaii, which benefits these sons of the mission who are holding land. Okay. So, Ka'ahuhui uh, Wanaleo o Hawaii. That's the Hawaiian Evangelical Association. Again, that's the local body of churches, right, that, 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 uh, that controls the churches in Hawaii. Um, it's led by the Papa Hawaii or the Hawaiian board in Honolulu. Reverend Rufus Anderson <coughs> came to Hawaii in 1863 to bring that kind of demand. He'd been saying it by letter for 10 years, since 53. Um, but now he comes to, to kind of look over the handover of power to Honolulu, and he really wants to emphasize to them uh, that they haven't been doing their job. Uh, we mentioned last week, by 1863, there were four ordained pa native pastors, right? So in 43 years, they'd ordained four pastors, four native pastors. So the creation of an association of churches out of the former mission. On 6th March, 1863, Reverend Rufus Anderson representing the American board, was welcomed at the palace by Mo'i Alexander Liho Liho and Mo'i Wahina Emma. Uh, the reverend delivered a letter from the board that recognized the native Christian community in the Hawaiian kingdom as, quote, so far formed and matured that the American board ceases to act any longer as principal and becomes an auxiliary. Okay? So that's very important to understand. This is 1863. This is a formal declaration by the ABCFM, by their board, um, that they recognized the the, uh, the 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 native Christian community in Hawaii as being able to to, to take care of themselves and, is, and they don't need the board anymore. So the sixty three uh, uh, associations again in a published summary that followed his return to America, Reverend Anderson wrote a prescient note foreshadowing the turbulent times ahead for the Hawaiian churches. So once he sees what's going on and he sees this lack of native pastors and he sees this lack of native decision making in the Ahuhui Wanalu Hawaii, he goes home and he writes this. He says, it seems obvious that if the native clergy and people did not soon have conceded to them as much agency in the management of their religious affairs as they already had in the affairs of state, serious evils must ere long arise, right? So he's saying, if these sons of the mission don't turn over power, religious power to native Hawaiians, like they have political and economic power, then we're going to have a big problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the churches, so there's this push and pull, right, after 63. So Native Hawaiian Christians who are very adept and, 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 and intelligent and know what's going on, um, not only are pushing for control of their churches, and they, and they do have practical control of their churches. I want to be clear about that. As I mentioned before, in the churches in Lahaina, in the churches in Hilo and so forth, they were, everything was done in Hawaiian. Uh, mostly by Hawaiians and so forth, uh, um, but they're sending delegates to Honolulu. So they had practical control of their churches, but there's still this body, this, this polity that, that's looking centralized, right, which is the opposite of what this mission is supposed to be, where the Ahuhui Wanali Hawaii is controlling the decision-making, the replacement of certain pastors and so forth, and importantly, the land. 
And so Native Hawaiian Christians around the islands start to incorporate their churches under Hawaiian kingdom law so that they can therefore own the land, right? The land had been given to the ABCFM in the Mahele. Um, after 1863, a lot of that had been turned over to the Ahuhui Wanaleo o Hawaii. So this local association controls that land. The local association is controlled by the Papa Hawaii, which is mostly white. So there, so the, the people in the churches are saying, well, wait a minute, like we should have control over our own church land. So they start to incorporate. And the, one of the first churches was in Lahaina. I have that one here. These are the actual incorporation papers here on the left. January 19th, 1872, uh, Palapala Ho'ohui Eklesia, the incorporation of the church, Wainei Lahaina Maui, Nakahu Vaivai, the trustees, Oka Eklesia Ho'ole Pope O Wainei. I love that term. <laughs> the term in Hawaiian for Protestant is the church without Pope. Ho'ole Pope O Wainei Lahaina Maui. Okay. So they can, the, the trustees are allowed to sell and buy property. With the approval of the church, right? So this, this formal legal document, this is more than church polity, this is Hawaiian kingdom law is saying that the trustees of the church with the approval of their congregations can make decisions to buy and sell property, okay? That's it's critical because we're gonna look later at how the, UC, the, the, the UCC, the Ahuhui Wanaleo Hawaii is selling church property and, and claiming that they own the church property and so forth. But here's Kanaka Christians taking control of that themselves. I wanted to put this in here just for kind of, not for, just for fun, it is important, but, but this is an incredible photograph that, that I discovered about seven years ago. Um, the only photograph we have of Waina'i Church in Lahaina there, which is Keopuolani's church, founded in 1823. From, 18, from 1820s and 30s, it was always sketches. We didn't have any photographs. This one was we discovered in the Hawaiian Mission Houses Museum. This is actually Moku'ula in the foreground. This is the sacred fish pond uh, that, that, that uh, was Moku'ula. And in the background there, you see the church. This is circa 1850s, one of the first daguerreotypes taken in Honolulu. Uh, and it was taken from Front Street, looking back at the church. And that's the church that, that Ho'opili built, that housed close to 3,000 people, uh, that had two services on Sundays, usually with almost with a full house. So you're talking about six, five to 6,000 people attending church there uh, on Sundays in the 1840s and 50s. Okay? So the struggle for control. So now Hawaiians are claiming their churches. And you're starting to see the sons of the mission, and I'm generalizing, not every single one of them, yeah, the vast majority of the sons of the mission, and especially the officers of the Ahuhui and Leo Hawaii, the ones that are in control, are pushing back, right? They're starting to understand that if we are going to continue with this um, control of Native Hawaiians, it's going to happen within the churches, right? And so we need to remain in control of the churches. And so this is a letter from Samuel Chapman Armstrong. Samuel Chapman Armstrong was a mission son of one of the first missionary Armstrong. Uh, he was a Civil War hero who fought for the North uh, and then started the Hampton Institute, which was a school to train African Americans and American Native Americans to become school teachers and so forth. Lauded and even lionized in a lot of the biographies because of his work in that. Um, but if you go into his actual writings and letters, you start to see uh, this paternalistic and this infantilization of the Native peoples. Uh, and that's just, and specific to Hawaii, we want to see it here because we're starting to see the sons of the mission understand that as the Hawaiian kingdom grows in, in achievement, it's, you know, we've already, uh, we've already created a constitution in 1840 that was recognized by England and France. They're creating consulates around the world. As the, as the native run Hawaiian kingdom starts to gain more prominence and respect and recognition around the world, that's going to mean less control over Native Hawaiians for the white missionaries here, right? And so they start to push back. Chapman writes an article in the Journal of Christian Philosophy. Now, again, I'm going to go back to my thing here and, and, and ask us to remember that we're talking about these are, they're, they're, they're proposing that these are Christian thoughts and Christian ideals. So in the Journal of Christian Philosophy, Samuel Chapman Armstrong writes a, an essay in 1854 called Lessons from the Hawaiian Island. And he says, the sharp brain of the savage easily outstrips his sluggish moral nature. So he starts to argue against too high of an education for Native Hawaiians. And he does this uh, in several letters talking about Kamehameha schools. We'll, we'll look at that in our third and final presentation where he talks about that we don't want any higher education in the Kamehameha schools because he, he, he felt like Hawaiians would get too haughty, too full of themselves, and their natural sluggish moral nature would give them brain power 
to sin better with and so forth. And these are the types of things that he's, so, and, and, and much of the, you know, depending on the person, um, you can argue whether or not they really believed it or whether or not they were making a political argument. Um, with folks like Serena Bishop, they were almost purely political arguments. He knew better. Um, but nevertheless, this is the narrative that's coming out of the leaders of the, of the white Christian church in Hawaii. Reverend Charles McEwen Hyde was president, principal of uh, Kikula, uh, Kikula Uhunapule Okapakapika Akau, which is the North Pacific Missionary Institute. It was set up in 1872 specifically to train native pastors, to get more native pastors into the, into the churches. And about 95% of the native pastors who became pastors after the 1870s went through the school. He's the head principal there. He's also a trustee at Bishop Museum and at um, the uh, Kamehameha Schools. He says at the same time, oops, call him in. He says at the same time, Hawaiians, only three generations removed from barbarism, by barbarism are not fitted for self-government. They cannot reason logically. Now, you, and again, in the context of the fact that with help, of course, with legal help, Kawikioli had made the decision to create a constitution in 1840. He had gotten recognition in 1842, three pushed by Timoteo Hotlelio and William Richards. And he had gained recognition in 1852, or they had offered universal suffrage in 1852, and many other things. So this idea of the fact that they cannot reason logically, I think, uh, is coming out of this, this need to, to create a political narrative, not something he really believed. Nonetheless, either way, an incredibly racist statement. Uh, the struggle for control. So Hyde uh, also says this, and he writes a letter in June, uh, June 5th, 1887, to Reverend E.K. Alden, where he says, the Hawaiians are, are to all intents and purposes a separate organization, only a few pastors meeting in the Hawaiian board for some matters of common interest. The question for the Hawaiian Association will be whether to break with us entirely or to form a new association. So by the 1880s, and, and this is, so there were 10 in, in Oahu, there were 11 Ahuhuio and Alio Ohawaii churches. There were 10 native churches and one white church. And Hyde even writes about this later. And he says, that's one of our biggest problems is this, is this fear of miscegenation and, and this fear, this separation of the races. He said, if you look at the Catholic church, they're, they're all mixed. If you look at the Mormon church, it's basically run by Hawaiians. And he said, but we're, we have a white church and we have the native churches. And, and nine, nine out of 10 of the native pastors for those churches came to Kalakaua and said, let's create a native Hawaiian board of churches. We don't need them anymore, right? They're, they're not turning over power. Let's just create our own board. Kalakaua didn't follow through with the plan, but that's what Hyde and others are worried about at this point. So with this pushback, now they're pushing, they're feeling a, a need to take even stricter control. Reverend Anderson O. Forbes said on June 7th, 1887 says, uh, so he says, like the statement of Kamehameha III, and this is super important, that sacred statement that Kawiki Oli said, uh, with the return of independence, the life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. And that was the motto of the leadership of the nation moving forward. Anderson writes, but instead of that, he says, the hindrances to the development of Christian growth among the people have been steadily increasing. It's as if the famous words of Kamehameha the third, life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness, have been replaced by the ruling government with the words, life of the land is perpetuated by sin, right? So it's, it's, it's a significant effort to try to discredit Native Hawaiian Christians and the leadership of, of, of the Native Hawaiian leadership of the churches. That comes in the annual report of 1887 in the Hawaiian language version. Um, okay, so at this point, again, as I mentioned, there's pressure on the on the league to, to remain in control, um, and so they are the Ahu um, Wanalei Hawaii, the the Papa Hawaii, and so they form the Hawaiian League. Uh, and contrary to its name, the Hawaiian League was an all white organization. It was a secret organization. Uh, the under Hawaiian Kingdom law, the Department of the Interior had had overwatch on this. Under Hawaiian kingdom law, you were not as allowed to, to, to form social clubs like this uh, without a charter and without being chartered by the Hawaiian kingdom. But the, the, but the white Christian community in Hawaii formed a league in late December 1886, started by Lauren Thurston and a guy named um, Dr. McGregor, an American dentist, 
formed together this league because they started talking about about protecting and uh, the white community in Hawaii. And there was no threat to the white community in Hawaii, no literal threat. So what they're doing is they're starting to form this, this community, this association, this, and you're going to see later, this army, this militia that can carry out their plan, which is this new mission, which is take political control of Hawaii. Ever since the mid 1860s to 70s, they understand that it's, you know, we're getting pushed back in this corner, in that corner, in this corner. So what we need to do is take political control of the country. So they start the Hawaiian League. We're blessed to have the original membership book, the original notes, the original charter. Why? Because it's important to understand these men weren't just, um, they, they had a measure of egotism to them. They thought that we would be sitting around today applauding their work. Um, because they had believed, you know, they, again, they had gone to college in America in the 1850s and 60s. They had been infused with this idea of manifest destiny, of Darwinism, and so forth. And they believed that they should be in control of Hawaii. So in this Hawaiian League, as I mentioned, the original record of members is here. Um, there's Lauren Thurston's signature over the side. And we start with the uh, membership on the right. Sanford Ballard Dole, Lauren A. Thurston, P.C. Jones, W.U.R. Castle, Dr. Tucker, Kenny Cook, and you know, basically a running list of the white Christian missionaries in Hawaii. And we see their oath. So um, the oath of, that you had to take. Now, again, remember we're talking about the, the white Christian community in Hawaii, the leadership of the Ahuhuiu on Hawaii. Um, almost all of them take this oath. Hyde never joins. Um, for whatever reasons, but the rest of them do. And they take this oath, what color am I? Mm -mm -mm. There we go. <laughs> I do solemnly promise upon my honor that I will keep secret the existence and purposes of this league, that I will not in my position as a member of any military organization, oppose or oppress the white citizens of this kingdom, that I will stand by it and support my military superiors in their necessary efforts to protect the white community of this kingdom against any arbitrary or oppressive action of the government. Rings a little familiar today, right? There's these, they were this local group of, of Hawaiian kingdom subjects, <clears throat> right? Right. We're talking about folks. So in the, you know, if, if we transplant it to today, we're talking about like a group of American citizens who form a private militia, a secret private militia that says, if the government pushes against us, we're going to have, be able to defend ourselves. And they're not going to—they're not talking about defense. They're talking about laying into plan, as I mentioned, um, what hap what comes to be the 1887 coup. Here's the outside of the book. Um, some of the members of the league who took that oath to protect the white citizens of Hawaii: Lauren Andrews Thurston, William Richards Castle, Charles Montague Cook, Stanford Ballard Dole, Henry Perrine Baldwin. We're talking about the leadership of the Big Five today. Nathaniel B. Emerson, Reverend Neville Forbes, William Brewster Olison, Paris, Sir Evans Reno Bishop, Lyman, and Emerson, right? And that's just a few. Uh, some, I had some really wonderful students of mine put together. We ha I have the entire list. It's over 400 names of the membership of the Hawaiian League. So we, we do have that available. Um, okay, so, they, so again, they formed the, this secret club. The Sons of the Mission Prepared to Act. So the white officers of the Papa Hawaii, the Hawaiian board, now saw the removal of King Kalakaua as something essential to the success of their new religio-political mission, right? They've gone so far from what, from what um, Reverend Anderson had, had dreamed up, what those kids had dreamed up in C Connecticut at Williams College in 1807. Um, they're literally saying that the removal of King Kalakaua, the taking over of this government by us, by this tiny minority of citizens who are white, is, part, is the new mission of, of our group. Reverend Charles Hyde writes a letter in January 13th, 1887, which is about three weeks after the formation of this Hawaiian League, this club. Recent developments show what a vile man the king is and that a change must soon come in the interest of decency and good order and public morals. What else can be expected from an irresponsible savage? So long as this king and this constitution continue, there's humanly speaking not very much to be done. Heathenism and Christianity will soon be pitted in open conflict here. Now, you can't get more straightforward than that. This is Reverend Charles Hyde, an officer of the Ahuhui Wanaleo of Hawaii, saying we must remove the, the, sought, the elected king of Hawaii. That's, that's in any country in the world you're talking about treason. You're talking about saying, let's get rid of the king. That what their plan was to overthrow the king, uh, declare a republic, and then run Hawaii 
um, by the, the right Christian, Christian mission to run away. You know, it's, it's right there in his words. The next letter comes from the same gentleman, Reverend to Hyde to Bond, on February 18th, 87. All the Hawaiian pastors on Oahu have, with one exception, just petitioned the king to appoint and head a board of missions purely Hawaiian, throwing overboard the present Hawaiian board with its foreign influence and its missionary members. I had alluded to that letter a little earlier. This is the actual letter, right? So the sons of the mission in the 1887 coup, you know, we always talk about the 1893 coup. Uh, a coup doesn't always result completely in the, in the erasure of the old government. Sometimes it, it implements a new constitution, things like that. And that's what happened here. We're talking again about a group of, in, uh, some of them Hawaiian kingdom citizens, subjects, some of them outside white, white Christians, rising up using this secret group they had formed, using this militia that they had attached to the group. Now, I, I need to mention that for a moment. The Honolulu Rifles was a private militia that was formed in the 1850s for the defense of the Hawaiian government. There had been, you know, there was no standing army in Hawaii. They had sheriffs and policemen and so forth. There had been several sailor riots. There had been things like that. And so they, they put together a private militia that was that in its charter. It was chartered in 1853. And in its charter, it says the king may call out this militia of private citizens to support uh, law in Hawaii and order and so forth. And so they were, you know, I think of them as a now as a Blackwater today, right? They were this private militia. But these folks were, were under charter of the kingdom. But yet in that 1880s period, the Hawaiian League had basically infiltrated the Hawaiian, had the Honolulu Rifles, convinced them all to join, included new members, and had risen, risen their membership to over 450 men who had, who were, who had an allegiance to the Hawaiian League. And that mil militia, that private militia, goes to Kalakaua and demands that he implement a new constitution. Now, there's so many things illegal about that. Number one, the king can't implement a new constitution. He can sign it. He, he can, with the approval of the legislature and his cabinet, institute a new constitution. Now, we're, you know, Kamehameha V had declared one, right? right? But this is, any lawyer in the world would tell you this is under coercion, right? When you go with a militia of 100 guns and you tell the, the, the executive, sign this or we're going to kill you, um, you know, it's not really a legal document. But nonetheless, whether it's legal or not, what we're talking about is uh, white Christian leadership of Hawaii overthrowing the country. Um, Sanford Ballard Dole to his son, to his cousin, G. Dole, on July 6th, 1887, which is the day of the Bayonet Constitution was implemented. He says, we've been working on a new constitution night and day. Sanford Ballard Dole was president of the HMCS, the Hawaiian Mission Children's Society. He was vice president of the Ahuhui Wanaleo Ohava'i and a member of Central Union Church. He was one of the leadership of white Christianity in Hawaii. And he, had, and he writes right here, I've been working on a new constitution. Um, you know, if, if a small militia uh, of, was working on a constitution in America to, to force it on President Biden, and you know, it's the same, we're talking about the same type of relationship. If he doesn't accept it, he will pro be promptly attacked and a republic probably declared. As I mentioned last week, there were two, two groups within the Hawaiian League, basically. One was a little more vociferous. The Thurston group wanted to kill Kalakaua, declare a republic and take over. The Dole version was a little more, you know, well, let's, let's, let's force him to sign this constitution and then we'll get power. Neither of them thought he would. They thought they'd be able to kind of just implement their new constitution. He kind of was a thorn in their side by accepting the constitution and actually because he stayed in power uh, and actually fought with what power he did have for the next five or six years or next four years. Okay. So the 1887 coup, coup bayonet constitution for those who say, well, I don't know if the, if the, if the sons of the mission were really involved in the, in the coup and so forth, the constitution was written by these gentlemen was signed by these gentlemen and Thurston's Thurston's copy has uh, the, a list of the names on the back. Um, Dole, Thurston, and Nathaniel B. Emerson, uh, Oliver Pomeroy Anderson, uh, Castle, and Cook. Um, the new constitution shifted executive power from the head of state to the cabinet. It gave the legislature veto power over the executive appointments to cabinet. So Kalakaua would choose his cabinet like every executive, chief executive does, but the legislature could override and dismiss them and he'd have to choose someone else. That's what happened during Lili'u's reign. She had cabinets that lasted two days because the legislature, or the cabinet, uh, and the legislature would work together to, the legislature, I'm sorry, would work together to overthrow the cabinet. The 1887 constitution specifically disenfranchised Asians. They had had the vote since 1852. If you're Chinese, if you're Japanese, 
in Hawaii, if you're Filipino in Hawaii and any of those, any race in Hawaii, you could become a citizen since 1852, own property and vote. 1887 constitution specifically disenfranchised all Asians in the kingdom. So they'd had the vote for, for 35 years and now it was gone. Oops, sorry. They raised the income clause, which disenfranchised many native Hawaiians. They said, you have to have X amount of money to vote um, or property. It enfranchised foreign white residents. And this I've never heard of in another constitution. And that is, you didn't even have to be a citizen. If you were white, if you could read, read English or European language and you were white, you could vote in the, in the kingdom of Hawaii without being a citizen. You just had to be a resident. So while it's disenfranchising Asians, while it's disenfranchising Hawaiians, it's enfranchising more white folks in Hawaii. And it made the House of Nobles elected. <clears throat> the House of Nobles had always been that balance of power with the popular vote in the kingdom. And it kept, it was that kind of one continuation from pre-constitutional -constitu pre monarchy when you had an absolute monarchy. The, the monarch prior to Kamehameha III, Kamehameha I and Kamehameha II appointed folks that he trusted appointed folks he thought were worthy and so forth. And that's what the House of Nobles had been through the 40s and 50s and 60s. The Moe could appoint those high-ranking families in Hawaii and so forth that had knowledge, that had you know, power and so forth. That's changed in the 87 constitution. It's made completely elected. And, we, and we, as we just mentioned, that electorship, those voters have been shifted to, to more to, <clears throat> towards white folks in Hawaii. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> Sons of the Mission in the 1887 coup, Charles McEwen Hyde writes to Judge, Judge Smith on July 21st, 1887. He says, the government example, the executive power is taken out of the hands of the Hawaiian people who are utterly incapable of managing the government or any business as our American understands businesses, understand business. These islands are no longer to be managed in the interest of the Hawaiians, but of the cosmopolitan population now resident exclusive of the Chinese. Right? And again, these are words from their own handwriting. This is the white Christian community in Hawaii have... <laughs> engaging in a socio-political mission uh, and actively taking over Hawaii. <clears throat> Sons of the Mission in the 1887 coup, Reverend Oliver Pomeroy Anderson, Emerson wrote to Judson Smith and he equated the 87 coup, he said, it was the noble stand the Sons of the Mission took. So, you know, there is no argument whether or not the Sons of the Mission were involved in, in these political things. Emerson says he's proud of the fact, he writes that this 87 constitution was a noble stand the sons of the mission took. Reverend Serino Edwards Bishop, um, as we mentioned last week, one of the most vociferous uh, opponents of Hawaiians of the day, son of the mission, uh, um, principal at Lahaina Luna School, editor of the Friend, member of the Central Union Church and a member of the Hawaiian League. The Friend was the mission paper for Hawaii, the mission monthly paper. Up until 1887, it had been run by Samuel Damon and a couple of others, and it had been mostly a uh, keeping track of ships that came in. It was a governmental paper, keeping track of ships that came in, keeping track of arrivals, but also gospel things and church things and so forth. Reverend Serena Bishop takes over on August 1887, the month, the first month after the coup of 1887, and so he's the new editor, and the first issue that comes out of the Friend in 1887 in August says this, the politics of this country are fast ranging themselves along Anglo-Saxon lines. He has an article in that first issue called Anglo-Saxonizing Machine. And he says that Hawaii is developing itself into a fine Anglo-Saxonizing machine. And he says this, the resistless tide of Anglo-Saxon principles of government suddenly overtopped the frail palace dikes and swept away all that retrograde rubbish. It can hardly be doubted that all parties concerned will take but a short time to become thoroughly convinced that this civilized kind of government has come to stay. And the sooner they adapt their ways and plans to it, the more likely they are to retain a share in it. So again, Christian minister, uh, leadership of the white Christian community in Hawaii is saying, um, we've swept away Hawaiian leadership. We've swept away Hawaiian leadership in the churches. If they want any share of leadership at all, if they want any share of, of, of the, the power at all, They've got to follow us. Yeah. That's, it's an incredibly different mission than what was sent here in 1820. Bishop says, we declare to them that the Anglicized civilization is settled in this country and is inevitably to prevail. Their only good prospect is hardly to fall in line with it, earnestly to study and, the, and to diligently practice all that is pure, just, true, lovely, and good report in these thoughts, customs, and habits of the holiday. In the same issue of the friend, Serena Edward Bishop, uh, in the Hawaiian Mission Children's 1888, and he quotes the annual report. 
And it says this, our wonderful revolution has made this the most marked historic year of the Hawaiian kingdom since our society was organized. Some of our own HMCS, Hawaiian Mission Children's Society, were among the framers of the new constitution. And in the new order of things, the number of cousins already in honorable stations of governmental trust have been much increased. His Excellency L.A. Thurston is Minister of the Interior. Honorable Sanser B. Dole has been enrolled among the members of the Supreme Bench. Eight cousins are in the Board of Health and Education, while the Privy Council of State in the House of Nobles and the Representative Hall, we find a full score of our members. So it's the plan is laid out. Um, we, the white Christian community in Hawaii, have taken over and we've gotten, we've infiltrated the government and we're, we're happily in charge. And this is a wonderful historic year for us. Now, the Queen writes back to this in her book, uh, Hawaii Story by Hawaii's Queen. And she, you know, and, and in our third present, our third, uh, my third presentation next week, I'm going to talk quite a bit about native thought and action in the churches. And so we're going to see how they told this, this white Christian leadership at the time, you're not Christian. Your, your grandfathers were Christian. Your fathers and grandfathers were Christian. You've become apostates, right? And the queen says something along the same lines in her book when she says this about that 1887 coup. Whatever the faults of Mr. Gibson, Gibson was one of Kalakawa's uh, close, close advisors, so long prime minister of Kalakaua, he was an able man and his only public crime was his loyalty to the king. And it was for this reason that he and his son-in-law, Mr. Fred Hazelden of Lanai, were seized by a mob composed of the missionary party armed with rifles and marched down the public streets to the wharves. So these two citizens were forced along into a structure of the wharf where hung two, where hung two ropes with nooses already prepared. And a man of widely known missionary ancestry led the outcry vociferating loudly and lustily, hang them, hang them. Could it be possible, I thought, that a son of one of my early instructors, the child of such a lovely and amiable Christian mother, could so far forget the spirit of that religion his parents taught and be so carried away with the political passion as to be guilty of murder? Yet he was not the only one, by any means, who seemed to have forgotten those principles of our Lord to teach which their parents had come to our shores, right? So beautifully, the queen says, um, have you forgotten Christianity? Komike ho eo eo an ecclesia apuni ap kapai aina, i kapai aina, Committee of Hawaiian Evangelization. So after Bayonet, we see Kalakawa pushing back. We see with what power he has. We see this uprising in the churches that I'm going to talk about next week. A full force manifestation. We, the, after Bayonet, we see the first creation, I mean, the creation of the first native Hawaiian political party. Hui kalai aina, ahuhui kalai aina Hawaii. Right. So they, they're pulling together a, a political party. They're saying we've got to register to vote. We've got to take on this this awful bayonet constitution that is exclusive and is not letting people vote and so forth. So the mission. So the again, the reaction of the white Christian mission is we need more help. We need to 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 get them back under control. So they're going to form a new missionary association within the Ahuhui Wanalio Hawaii. The ABC of Family says no way. And so they're going to form their own missionary association to get Hawaiians to stay in the churches and fall back under white leadership. They do it in two ways. One is by having a native Hawaiian lead this effort. I'm going to talk about that next week. His name is John Henry Wise. But they also form an association within their Ahuhui Unleo Hawaii that's called the Committee on Hawaiian Evangelization. And that committee, it's important to look at the polity of that association. Now, remember, we're talking about congregationalists. Right, we're talking about folks who are supposed to be de delivering power to the individual Christians. Nathaniel B. Emerson, on August 28, 1887, which is about a month after bayonets, right? He's talking about putting together this 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 new association, and he says this: "The roots of evil are strong in this community, and will yet bear their crop. This being the case, I believe it is wise policy to exclude from places on this new board the Hawaiians." who when the evil day shall come, cannot be depended upon to stand like a rock against this current, right? Now that, you know, go from 1820, when they're talking about bringing the gospel of Christ and handing it to Hawaiians, to a point in August 87, where, there's, where the sons of the mission are saying, we don't think Hawaiians should be allowed to be a part of this, of this missionization association, right? And they go on further to say, the counsels of such men as Judd, Judd Judd, Reverend A.O. Forbes, Reverend H.L. Parker, Reverend S.E. Bishop, Reverend C.M. Hyde, W.O. Smith, whose names as white members of the Hawaiian board are doubtless familiar to you, would be invaluable as members of this committee or new board. But it would seem to me that it is desirable to have these men or three of them on this board with the, new under with the understanding that native Hawaiians should not form any part of the representation on this new committee or board. 
It may seem strange and unaccountable to you that there should exist such a distrust of the purely Hawaiian element in the Hawaiian board. But let me say that though I was born on this island and I'm well acquainted with the language and the people, yet the history of the Hawaiian churches and pastors for the past few years shows to my mind that Hawaiians are not possessed of the soundness of judgment and the stability and independence of character that is needed in directing the affairs of a committee or board that shall have the management of such an enterprise as again resuming direct missionary work among the Hawaiians themselves. Listen to this. It certainly is a delicate matter to exchange to exclude, I'm sorry, this be exclude, to exclude purely Hawaiians from representation on a committee or board to be made up in part of members selected from a board of which they form an integral portion. But I do not see how it can be avoided. So they're forming, <laughs> so they're forming a board of missionization of Hawaiians out of Hawaiian Mission Children's Society and the Ahuwi Wanalu Hawaii. And they're saying, though the Ahuwi Wanalu Hawaii had allowed, if possible, and it had, already, it had always been a tiny minority, but Hawaiians had been able to get into the 18 leadership positions of the, just not the board, but the 18 positions of the Ahuwi on Hawaii, but they've got to make sure that not a single Hawaiian is part of the leadership of this new association. The last, uh, so they, they form this new committee. Um, they convince uh, a gentleman to come out from uh, New England. His name is William Westervelt. He's the final missionary that comes to Hawaii. Um, he comes out to, to, they asked for 10, right? Uh, but they finally talked him into coming out as part of their new association. Uh, William Westervelt comes out. He tells them what they're doing isn't correct. He goes and does his own mission work on Maui, on Lanai, and other places. He basically says, I don't listen. I don't have, you know, you guys don't have authority to, to, um, to boss me around and what you're doing is wrong anyway. Uh, so it falls apart within a, within eight months or a year. And then he becomes his own kind of, um, anthropologist and, and, and person who resigned from the mission. So this last effort of, of missionary um, sent, to, sent to Hawaii has failed. Um, we have the death of King Kalakaua in San Francisco in 1881. Uh, we have the as assumption of the throne by his sister, Lili Uokalani. And now we have the sons of the mission coming together, having perpetrated the 1887 coup, having asked for more missions, having asked for more missionary help, not getting any help from Boston, Boston saying what they're doing is wrong. Uh, and they're looking at finally, we've got to put an end to this back and forth, you know, pushing and pulling. We've got to take control of Hawaii. And that's the seeds that start the plan for the 1893 coup. At this time in 1891, the, actually just a little bit prior, they had written to Samuel Chapman Armstrong, the gentleman I had mentioned earlier, who was a leader in the, um, uh, churches back in the churches back in New England and told him to use his political clout to send a U.S. minister to Hawaii who would be helpful to them. And that's when Minister Stevens, an, an ardent an annexationist, comes to Hawaii and starts to work with the white Christian community in Hawaii to overthrow Queen Lily Oakland in 1893. We'll get into that next week. We'll also get into Native Hawaiian action throughout this period. Um, and for today, that's it. Mahalo, uh, Kumuran, for another excellent presentation. Um, yeah, sometimes the truth is heavy to hold. Um, well, to start, I, I would invite folks, if you have questions, as always, please put them in the chat. Maybe we'll take a few here and then wrap up for this evening. Um, I was wondering, Kumuran, um, what kind of role did um, the daughters of the missionaries play? Like, do we have any information about that? Hmm. There's not much written. Um, we know that they didn't take a, a prominent political role that wasn't seen as their place. Um, interestingly, you know, the first time, I don't want to say the first time, but the first, the first time we see significant um, participation of women in, in politics and other than the traditional Native Hawaiian participation, which had always been, um, is in, the, in 1900 when Hawaiians formed their own new political party, the Home Rule Party. The Democratic Party and the Republican Party, women are nowhere near. They, they encourage their husbands and so forth. Um, but the Home Rule Party, three of the members of their, of their board that creates the party are women. Women go out and, 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 um, and make speech and make political speeches from the stump with Wilcox. When Wilcox is going around the islands, you know, trying to win the election for Native Hawaiian Party, there are women who are, who are speaking before him. There's one woman, Kalua Palawa Kama who's a prominent, you know, she's, she's getting famous as a political speaker. She's from Laie, which is interesting. She was LDS, um, but she's, she's going against her church and doing this. 
but um, so there were women that were that were very much part of politics for the Home Rule Party. But prior to that, you didn't see it. You didn't see it prominently. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, someone asked, "Can you show the names of those who drafted the Bayonet Constitution?" Yeah. Let me. Um, <clears throat> Uh, let me work on that and, and if you have another question i can i can answer but let me pull that up okay another kind of practical question someone had asked about um getting access to copies of your powerpoints um i don't give out the slides um there's several reasons why i do in some of my talks and most of my talks this is the first one where i don't but i, I can't with this one for two reasons one is because some of the not in this this slide but some of the information i get is from others who i haven't asked permission to share um, the more central reason is this is very much part of my book that's that's going to come out, and the publishers uh, get really angry when you tell everybody, the, you know, give everybody all the information that you're going to that they're going to try to sell them later. So to be honest, that's 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 one reason I can't. Anything I mention, I'm welcome. Sources, sources and resources, I am happy to share. So anything specific that you'd like to have, I'm absolutely you know, happy to send them. Just not the creation of the content of the of the uh, presentation. Totally understand about the PowerPoints, thank you. Um, and just as a reminder to everybody, all of these sessions are recorded. So you can totally go back and, and watch uh, watch everything back again. Um, another question, let's see. Um, are you confident that it was um, the Papa Hawaii predecessors of the HCUCC officers who initiated um, the illegal bayonet constitution? Well, I mean, to be honest, it doesn't have anything to do with my confidence. It's right there, the, the written word. I mean, they they they, they say how great of us for doing this. You know, he said it's it's the proud stand of sons of the mission took. They signed the they signed the uh, they're the ones that are on the printer's draft names of the constitution. And I'll, and I'll put that up when I can find it. But but you know so and 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 again they write again. And I gave you I mean you know I'm worried about time, but I gave you some of the sources. There are hundreds. There's hundreds of letters and documents um, showing their involvement, showing their their leading. Uh, this march into now it wasn't only the mission folks who say the missionaries overthrew uh, the kingdom aren't correct because it was a, it was part of it was the thing that ties these men together whether they're businessmen whether they're agricultural interests whether it was that they were christian and they were this was part of their that was the association the, the body they were using to to implement this plan um but yeah it's 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 got it's it's, it's not about my confidence it's about the record and the record shows clearly they were absolutely involved Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, someone has asked, I noticed today, September 11th, um, 1897, 125 years ago, there was a very significant number, oh, sorry, very significant um, in monster petition against annexation. How were Christian churches used to organize the signing of the Kue petitions? Do these churches possibly signify some Aboriginal control over the congregation? So yeah, so yeah, and and I want to be clear that control. I want to be clear about what I'm saying. I'm not saying Hawaiians didn't control the churches. Of course they did. The whites controlled the administrative body. So so that's important to understand. The churches were always under were not always in in most cases the churches were under control. <clears throat> There's so many stories I could tell you about them being in control of their churches. Um, my dissertation looks at 13 case studies throughout the islands where just after the overthrow, and I don't want to give away too much of next week, but but just after the overthrow, um, the day after the overthrow at, 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 at the church in Lahaina, two days after the overthrow at Kamakapili Church, the deacons called together the members of the church to pray for the return of the queen, to pray and to fast. That's in direct contestation of their white members, of their leadership. They're saying, they're telling them, to the pastors, to preach against the queen, preach pro-annexation rhetoric, you know, and the congregations are not having it. So in every case that I found, I have 13 different case studies in every case that I found. Now, there were some native pastors who did that. Some of the motivations were they wanted to keep their jobs. Some of the motivations were they, some of the motivations to be, cl to be clear and to be honest, some of them really believed in it. Reverend Adam Polly from Lahaina, and we don't like to think about this or admit this, Reverend Polly from Lahaina, who was a native Hawaiian, you know, head to toe, said um, he believed becoming part of the United States was the right thing. You know, so 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 some of it believed it and some of it did it for keep their jobs. But nonetheless, when they preached against the queen and they preached pro annexation rhetoric from the pulpits, every single one of them was kicked out of their pulpits. They were voted out by the congregations, and they were, you know, and that's and then again, and that's what makes it so interesting when we talk about this story of race. 
it wasn't about race for Hawaiians. They were kicking out native Hawaiian pastors who had been their pastors for 30 years because it was about their ownership of their Christianity and it was about the, the kingdom. For the Haole, it was about race. Whites should rule the nation. But for Hawaiians, it was about God and country. Um, and so, so yeah, so, so um, the petitions did start in the, in the churches. They were almost, almost uniformly were, came out of the churches. Um, the, the first, one of the first meetings that launched the petition happened in Hilo at the Salvation Army and Hilo, uh, Hall in Hilo. Um, but also, yeah, the churches, Kamakapili Church, many of the other churches were where they gathered to sign the petitions. Um, the churches, I remember back then, the churches were kind of like the political halls. Um, so, so, yeah, so, so, so to be clear, uh, Native Hawaiians are, uh, in Hawaii were controlling their churches. Um, they were controlled administratively by a board that was almost exclusively white and it was, it was trying to keep control. Thank you. Um, who were the four, who were the four Hawaiians that were ordained and where can you find the 400-ish member names? Uh, the four, oh God, I'm going to spot it, David Malo, um, and those other three. <laughs> um, I don't remember, to be honest with you, off the top of my head right now, uh, but if somebody, if you email me the question, I'll be happy to answer it. Um, uh, the second question was about the list, the same thing. I mean, I, I, I'm happy to provide that list of 400 names. Um, yeah, so any resources I'm happy to provide. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Um, let's see, a source I read said that uh, Reverend William B. Olson was an ABC FM missionary from 1878 to 1893. Is this true? And was he one, um, was he one who drafted the Bayonet Constitution? So yes, isn't it William Brewer Strolson? And so yes, he was, he was brought here as a missionary to head Hilo boarding school. Um, Hilo boarding school was kind of the feeder school for Lahaina Luna and for the training of natives to become, to become pastors and teachers and school teachers and so forth. Um, and he starts from the months after he gets here getting involved. And if, as you saw in several of these slides, yes, he's one of the men who wrote the Bayonet Constitution. He was a member of the Hawaiian League. He took the oath to protect the white community in Hawaii um, and so forth. And so he was, he became, when they, he was the founding principal at Kamehameha Schools, when they founded Kamehameha Schools. Um, and so he was very much involved. Thank you. And um, this is the last question I have. So maybe we'll wrap up after this for today. Um, so this person has said, while this was happening in the government, wasn't some of the union churches in the HEA combined Native Hawaiian with new, newly plantation missions um, minimize the voices of Native Hawaiians? And I think they're asking, um, were some Hawaiians pushed out of their churches? Call mm. my if I'm um, reading yeah. that question. No, yeah, it, it, so that's a good question, and, and, and I think it speaks to this to something that's very, very important. So, and I, I don't think any Hawaiian was ever pushed out of their church. I think, I think, uh, no, many Hawaiians left the churches of the Ahuhui Wanalio Hawaii because of these political actions, um, but many didn't. And then this was a, this was one of my, the most important questions I had answered, and I had it for a long time because when you, when you, you know, when you talk to a component in churches, you don't just go in and start firing questions. You, you know, you listen, and then, and then if it's time, you know, they'll ask you if, if you have a question. And that's happened. I was at Bonanalua Church, and I asked one of the kupuna, I, and, and she said, well, you know, Ron, do you have any questions for me? And I said, and I wanted to tread lightly because, you know, because in my mind, I'm listening to all these things these guys are doing, and I'm thinking, why did, why didn't every Hawaiian leave those churches? You know, da da da. And I asked her, I said, well, you know, why do you think your kapuna stayed in the church at Vananalua? And she looked at me and she said, without a pause, she said, because it was our church. She said, it wasn't their church. She said, they were making up rules and da 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 da. She was, every, she was, this was our church. It's where we gathered, it's where we prayed together, it's where we lived. She goes, these churches were our churches. So it, it, in their minds, they never became their churches. Now, some, 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 many ones, as I mentioned, left to start to join other denominations and to also start their own churches. One of them was Ho'omano Na'o'el, which was started in the 50s, but came back in 93 because of these political actions. And it was a, it was a Native Hawaiian offshoot of the American Protestant Church that is still around today. Some of the churches are, are still around today. Wow, I'm really moved by that um, Luna's response. Thank you for sharing that. Um, well, that will kind of conclude our presentation for today. Thank you, uh, Kumaran. Oh. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. sorry. Can I say something? I just, I just found the Constitution. Can I? Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Hold on. Let me share my screen. So this is the printer draft of the Constitution. I'm not wholly unorganized, so I did find it. And again, you're welcome to come down to the Hawaii State Archives if you can and see the original. Um, it's you know, we're public archives. 
Um, this comes from the W.O. Smith collection. William Owen Smith was one of the members of the Hawaiian League. He was the attorney general for the provisional government, um, person chiefly engaged in drawing up the constitution. So we have Lauren A. Thurston, Jonathan Austin, Sanford B. Dole, William A. Kinney, William Owen Smith, Cecil Brown, Reverend Oleson, who we just talked about, Nathaniel B. Emerson, J.A. Kennedy, McCandless, George Wilcox, A.S. Wilcox, H. Uh, Henry Waterhouse, Wonderbird, Hitchcock, Roll, uh, Dr. Tucker, and C.W. Ashford. Okay, so that's that. And any other resources that I mentioned um, that someone would like, just email me. Great, mahalo, mahalo, uh, Kumuran. Um, Linda, I'll pass it to you for any closing remarks. Thank you. Wow, well, that was a lot of information to absorb. And I'm sure that I'm not the only person who just had a roller coaster of um, emotions as I listened. Um, it gives us a lot to think about, um, especially for those of us who are members of the United Church of Christ. Um, we will hear more next week and the week after that. Um, it was suggested that we close this session um, with Pule because uh, what was said by Cassie that this is really heavy information to hold is very true. So I've asked Kahu Brian if he would be willing to close us with prayer. So I'm gonna pass it to um, Kahu Brian now. Mahalo, Linda, and it is an honor to close this with prayer. Um, and I had the same roller coaster of emotions too, and very grateful for Ron, our leader, and in looking forward to that book also that is coming out. That's going to be, uh, it's gonna be changing very much so. But I really was touched by the words of the queen that you shared, and let's close in prayer by thinking of that. A pulikako, malakeakua for the opportunity to be um, enlightened, and we do know, as I prayed earlier, that when you know the truth, the truth can set you free. And so I just ask for continued wisdom, insight, favor, and, uh, and uh, boldness to be able to move forward in, in truth. We thank you that the words of the queen can inspire us and help lift some of that heavy burden we might feel. When we think about following the true teachings and the character of our savior, Jesus Christ, and his true love, aloha, and just to, to do things truly pono. I would ask that you would give us grace as we process and that we come prepared next week to be able to hear and receive again. We thank you in the name and power of that loving Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Mahalo Kahu Brian. And, and with that, we'll say aloha to everyone and hope to see you again next week. Aloha. Aloha.